Um, good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment, EBSCO, and Index Data. My name is Eric Hartnett. I'm the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's event. Today, we will be getting a look at Folio's acquisitions apps. Today's sessions, session, like all Folio Forums, is being recorded. It will be posted to the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel and to the resources section of folio.org. As an open forum, participants can see participants' names and all questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Please use the Q&A box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. If you'd like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speaker today is Dennis Bridges, Senior Director and Product Owner with EBSCO Information Services. And with that, I'll turn things over to Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to just get right into sharing my screen here. Okay. So it's, forgive me, it's been a while since I had the opportunity to present uh, in a forum, but um, my goal today is to show as much live uh, software as possible. So I have some slides, but really they're just prompts for getting into live demos at different sections. I'm hoping that everyone uh, was able to see the agenda for today's meeting, uh, or at least caught a glimpse of it in, before joining the forum. What we're, we're hoping to accomplish today is walking through the acquisitions apps, um, or as many as we have time to walk through, and we're going to start with organizations. We're going to look at creating an organization, making an organization a vendor, adding some of the specific details to an organization that you can add, uh, depending on whether that organization is a vendor or not. There are different different set of criteria. Um, then we're going to get into creating some orders. So we're going to create a simple uh, one-time order and, and a slightly more complex ongoing order and talk about the difference maybe between those two things a little bit. We will need to create purchase order lines for those orders. Uh, the purchase order lines are essentially where the title information lives. And we'll talk more about that. We'll explore how those orders will impact uh, funds. And when we get into talking about funds, talking about the financial aspect of the system, the encumbrances, the invoices, uh, and things that relate to that. We'll come back to the slides. Um, so we're not going to do live demo of funds. There hasn't been any real substantial changes there since last time we presented in the forum. So we'll look at organizations, we'll look at orders, and then we'll look at, we'll do some talking about how that's impacting funds and finances, and then we'll get into receiving um, and finish with looking at how receiving and the inventory application interact and even talk a little bit about how you might place holds on items that are on order and, and have some discussion there. My goal is that it's going to be sort of interactive. So Eric, I'm hoping you can kind of keep an eye on questions as they're coming into the chat and feel free to interrupt me as we're going along. Um, and we'll do our best to get through everything that we possibly can with the time we have left. Just a couple of quick notes on where I'm going to be demoing from, where you can find uh, this the sort of current features that we're going to be looking at today. So for the most part, uh, all of the live demo that we're doing initially here is going to be done from what is actually our Bugfest environment, because it's built on the Q3.1 release of Folio. So this is the mid-quarter three uh, release of Folio. Uh, that is publicly available now. Um, and that's where we're going to be doing this initial part of the demonstration, walking through organizations and, and creating orders and things. This environment happens to be hosted in Europe, so there might be a little bit of lag for me because I'm in uh, Western Canada, and hopefully it's not too bad. Uh, it hasn't been in my testing too bad, so uh, we'll, hope, we'll hope that it keeps up with us. And then at the end of the presentation, I want to do a quick preview of some of the stuff that's coming in the Q3 release. So we'll look at uh, the folio testing environment. And some of you may, may have 
had some exposure to that environment at some point and, and played around in there a little bit. Um, but we'll be in folio testing and we'll look at what is going to be the Q3.2 version of folio, which is known as DAISY. And I believe that's still true. I haven't heard anything about that changing. So I hope I've got that right. If not, feel free to correct me, please. Um, so let's get into it. First thing we're gonna do is create an organization. And I'm just going to pull up our environment here. Um, and is that large enough for folks to see reasonably well? I've got a pretty big, pretty wide resolution on my display here. I got a comment uh, if you could bump it up just a hair. Just a bit more. Get my, be able to see the chat here, okay. How's that? A little bit better? Looks good. Okay, so in creating an organization, really all we have to do uh, to get started is navigate to the organization's app, previously known as vendors, um, and click the new button in that three panel layout. That's gonna allow us to add a new organization. There are only two pieces of information um, outside of the organization status that are required and that's name and a code. So for an organization, all we really need to do are these three things to create uh, an organization that is not expected to behave as a vendor. And this distinction is important because if you, if you are trying to uh, create a, an organization that you want to order things from, um, that organization needs to be a vendor. So an important distinction there, an organization that is not a vendor cannot be used for ordering, okay? Um, beyond that, the organization also needs to be active. So certain aspects of the system, if an organization is inactive or pending, um, it won't be available to you as an organization you can order from, even if it is a vendor. I hope that's relatively clear. Outside of these basic details that you, you need to actually be able to create the vendor itself, we can add some alternative names, um, so this organization may be known as something else when they behave or when they're performing a different function. We can capture that information and some notes on that uh, particular name and add and remove those as needed. We can also add contact information to the organization itself. So this is address information that relates to the organization as a whole. Uh, maybe I'll just use something I've got saved to speed things up here. We can also add categories. Um, and this might be a good time to talk a little bit about the setup that needs to be done for you to use organizations. Categories are the only thing in the current, you know, in the 3.1 version of Folio that lives in settings. So this list of categories is populated based on what has been added to the settings area. And we can go take a look at that now. There are going to be a few defaults here uh, that exist already, but if you want to configure what's available, um, you can navigate to settings. And I'm going to actually open this up in a second tab. I just hold the control button there to open that up in a second tab. We'll navigate to organization settings where we'll find categories. We'll see all the categories that appear in that list. These categories are intended to describe uh, address information and other aspects of organization information um, and the functions that they perform. So you can see we've got customer service and main and payments and all these different things. Um, we could add Forgive me, I'm not super creative this morning, um, maybe because of our technical challenges. 
<laughs> but we can add and edit the different categories that appear here. Once we've done that, we'll see them as accessible here uh, when we're adding and creating address information. So we can have multiple categories for our addresses, for our phone numbers, for our emails, and our URLs. And again, these apply to the organization as a whole. Okay, so I'm going to start there. I'm going to save that bit of detail that we've added so far. And we can now see that appearing here when we're looking at our organization. And I notice that I changed the name, it's part of, okay. So the next thing that we would be able to do here uh, is to actually make this organization a vendor or we can add, uh, before we do that, some contact people, people that relate to this organization that have their own or share contact information with the organization. So they might have similar addresses or phone numbers. Um, they might have specific addresses and phone numbers. And these contact people are added in a slightly different way. So the contact people was actually a global list of contact people. So when I hit add contact, it brings up a list of contacts. We have a few contacts in the system here in this testing environment already. Um, but we can create new contacts and we can edit these existing contacts within the organization's app at the moment. So we might create a new contact just quickly here. active we see we get all the category information a contact person can also have addresses phone numbers emails and URLs and so on uh, so maybe we'll just give this person a phone number for now that's an office phone it might be certain language and this is customer service and returns. If I can save a contact, I can now edit this contact or head back to my organization record and actually assign that contact here. And I think it was test something. And in order to assign that contact, I would select it from the list and save. So I'm actually relating contacts to this organization. This particular contact could be added to other organizations, um, or it may, this contact might move from one organization to the next. So you can keep their sort of history and some of their specific contact information, but move them around from one organization to the other. Important note here is that these are not um, users from the users app. So this is a separate list of uh, people that do not exist in the users app. Uh, so you may have folks that are staff or other types of connections that are a user as well as a contact. And for the time being, those are two very separate things, okay? The other thing that you can do uh, with the organization is add interface information. So it doesn't need to be a vendor to have interfaces and these interfaces can also be shared. So it's a very similar pattern to contact people, but we're talking about interfaces here. Same idea, we can add new interfaces and then assign them to this organization or this organization may, uh, you know, use an interface that we've already defined in our system. And so we can just select that interface and add it uh, and assign it or associate it with this organization. Okay, so uh, we got a question in that realm. Um, so we, the question is, what options are available for contact URLs? Can you save admin and login data there? For contact URLs, um, there's no username or password associated with a contact URL. 
interfaces, there, there are password and username fields for interfaces that are encrypted. Um, and you require a specific permission to be able to see those passwords. So for an interface, for example, um, I'm just going to save this, what we've done so far here. We, we, if we've added password information, we see it as sort of uh, stars, you know, hidden stars. Uh, and we need a permission to actually show what those are. But for specific URLs associated with a contact person, there are no password or username fields. Yeah. That answers your question. So what's left to do here with the organization is make it a vendor so that we can use it for ordering. And when we toggle this vendor button, um, you'll notice that a handful of additional accordions appear on the record. Uh, so we can now capture vendor specific information like payment methods, um, currencies used, claiming intervals, expected invoice intervals, and uh, subscription information, tax related, vendor terms, um, account information, and EDI specific information that will be used in the future uh, for managing communication with this vendor via, e via Edifact initially, but via EDI in general, possibly down the road. So we can define this information for uh, any organization that we've indicated is in fact a vendor. And the more things we add here, the more will be required. So you may find as you're creating organizations, when you add accounts, uh, when you add an account and you try to save the record, it's going to tell you, well, no, actually, now you, now that you've added an account, you have to add information, certain amount of information for that account um, or other things that you're populating here. And the way around that, if you don't actually want the account, is just to remove that bit that you've added, you should be able to save. But we're going to add some account information for this uh, particular organization. so that we can talk a little bit about what that's going to do later on. So now that we've saved some additional information for uh, the organization as a vendor, we'll be able to go forward into orders and actually um, create orders for that uh, organization. So before, before you move on, uh, we got another question about phone numbers. Uh, is there a limit of how many phone numbers can be added to the uh, phone number field? And is there a separate field for fax numbers? Um, good question. There is no limit. And I suppose we didn't really look at contact people. Um, it's similar to what you would see with um, the organization information in terms of adding phone numbers there. But in this specific context, we can add as many phone numbers as we need. And we can indicate that one of them may be the primary phone number. This applies to address and URL as well. We can always identify a primary if needed. Um, and under type, you'll see fax as an option. But there's no validation being done on those phone numbers today. Does that answer your question? I, I imagine so. OK, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to head into creating some orders now. And before... <laughs> oh, sorry, one more follow-up question. Okay. Just got. <laughs> so uh, as far as lim limiting characters on notes fields, is there any limit on that? Notes fields in general. Um, that's a good question. Off the top of my head, I can't remember if there is uh, for description, for example, or the notes area on the vendor, um, whether there is a limit. And that's something I could get an answer for that and, and drop it into Slack. Um, 
because if there is a limit, it's it's fairly fairly expensive. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. So before we get into ordering, we're going to look at settings first again, and we're going to look at settings for the orders application specifically. We're only going to look at a few of these because um, the order templates we'll talk about at the end. Um, so for now, I just want to look at um, within this sort of general information, we can do a few important things that will help us as we are creating orders down the road. The first thing is to specify reasons for closure. So any given order can be pending, open, or closed. And when we close an order, it's going to be closed for a variety of different reasons. Of course, an order can be completed, which would be one of the reasons that it's closed. And so we'll always see completed here uh, as a default. But we can actually add additional reasons for closure uh, that support some of our other workflows. So um, for example, we could define something here. And when we go to actually close orders in the future, we'll be able to identify a reason for closure and add a note regarding that reason for closure. When we've created um, additional reasons for closure, those things we can actually edit or remove uh, as needed. So we're going to start there. And we're going to look at an area in setting that the settings that defines uh, an interaction between, or at least the default setting for an interaction between the order app uh, and specifically purchase order lines and inventory. So for specific format of material, um, and this is high level stuff that we're talking about here. So electronic, electronic materials, physical materials, or other, we can specify a default interaction between orders and inventory. We'll look more at what that really means when we're creating the order. But essentially, we can say that for physical items, by default, we would like to have an instance, a holding, and an item record in inventory that represent the things that we've ordered. Whereas for electronic things, we'd only want to have an instance and a holding in inventory, potentially, uh, or just an instance, or possibly nothing. So it's really up to you. And these are the defaults and they can be changed on an order by order basis as well. So we also have a format for other and by default that would, uh, that is set to none. So if we're ordering something that is format other, but there wouldn't be anything created in inventory to represent that thing by default. Okay. Next thing we're gonna do before we get started creating some purchase orders is to adjust the allowable purchase order line limit. So in Folio, we have the purchase order and we'll look at the details that are collected at that level. And then we've also got a purchase order line or potentially multiple purchase order lines for every purchase order. And here we can actually set a limit on the number of lines that we wanna see on any given order. And for, this, for simplicity's sake, for the demo, I'm gonna set this to one. Okay, the last thing in settings here that we can edit at the moment in the current version of Folio is um, criteria around the purchase order number itself. First things first, we can allow the user to edit the purchase order number. Um, so the system is going to generate an order number and we can give users the ability to edit that number if necessary, or we can remove that as a possibility just by unchecking this box. So now when we create an order, we'll see the purchase order number, but not actually be able to change it from what is generated by the system. And uh, the system is going to generate sequentially uh, order numbers, and we'll see some of the format setting there as we're creating orders. The other thing we could do is define some prefixes. These are things that the user could actually add to the beginning or the end of that purchase order number. Uh, so prefix to the beginning, suffix to the end, and we can define what these prefixes or suffixes are, which ones are available to uh, users as they're creating orders. Um, and that will ultimately be included in the purchase order number when that purchase order is saved. 
So those are the things that we can look at in settings. Now we're going to create a couple of orders. And the first one we're going to create, something fairly simple, just a one-time order um, for a number of copies of a specific book. Okay. And something to keep in mind, when you enter the orders app uh, in the current build of folio, you're going to land on purchase order lines. So you're not actually seeing purchase orders here, you're seeing purchase order lines. And one of the big reasons for that is this is where the title information lives. So easier to search by title, find a purchase order line here. Uh, and if you need to see the purchase order details, you can always view the PO. That should take me to PO. Um, uh, so you can see here now we've got order highlighted, purchase order. And we're only seeing the result that we actually come here to see. But purchase orders is also a place where we can search and filter. So we could either search, or, search and filter for order lines or orders themselves. But if we want to create a new order, we have to start by creating the purchase order and then adding lines to that purchase order. So to get started here, I'm going to go to orders and I'm going to click new. And you can see um, the system's given us already automatically. Okay, should we continue here? Yes, and we got a question before we start. Uh, if you try to delete or remove a PO with an alert like, are you sure you want to delete this, be generated? Yes, and it's a, so there are some restrictions regarding what you can do based on the status of the purchase order, whether it's pending, open, or closed. That's going to continue to evolve. Um, in the current build, it's relatively simple. There are some things that you just can't edit. Um, you should be able to delete a purchase order. So I, th I think we can get back into the workflow here. Um, is that fair to say that we can get started? Yeah, I think we're good. More chatting going on. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. So I'm going to start creating our one time order. Um, and we might select a prefix here just because we can. We're going to choose a vendor. Uh, and I could use our demo organization that we created, but we'll go with Amazon for now. We're going to say this is a one-time order. Uh, and those are really all the things that we have to specify here. We can also add bill to and ship to information. So I've created some demonstration addresses here. Uh, of course, they could be entirely different addresses. And the build to and ship to address are actually found or adjusted in settings as well. But they're under tenant settings. So these are assumed to be uh, actually the, the library's addresses or some of the actual libraries uh, or the tenants addresses. And so they're found uh, under tenant settings, uh, general, addresses. And here we can add more addresses as needed. And we'll be able to leverage those possibly in other aspects of the system, but definitely when you're, you're creating orders or invoices down the road and you have built to and ship to addresses. Okay. So that's where those addresses are coming from. And they're actually very simple formatting. There isn't a street field and a, and a postal code or a zip code field or anything like that. Um, they are formatted exactly how you format them here and they will be printed to the page uh, in that way. So we don't actually need to indicate a workflow status for the order. The system will automatically set it to pending unless we want to go directly to open or something like that. So if I leave it just as select here and I hit save, it's actually going to create that order for us. 
and adjust the workflow status to pending. So something that we're still working on in theory, nothing's happened to it yet. And the first thing that we need to do here is add a purchase order line for the actual title that we want to acquire. And so when we add a purchase order line, the first thing that we see here, uh, the first bit of information that we're asked for is the title information. Now we can define a title and a variety of, you know, the publisher information, some of the other uh, brief sort of bibliographic data, or we can look for something that might exist in inventory already, whether it was imported or we've already ordered this thing in the past. And we can use the instance information from inventory to populate our order form. So that's what I'm going to do today. And this may not be a real world example here. Um, I'm going to choose one of my go to's. And that's going to populate the title information. It'll pull uh, publisher edition. It'll pull product IDs, if there are some, uh, and contributors and other information about that particular item. You can also see at the moment, it verifies that there is in fact an instance ID uh, for that thing. So there is a direct connection between this purchase order and that instance. So when we um, now go through and we talk about the format of this order, so we're gonna pretend that this is a purchase vendor system, um, and it's a physical order format. So we're only getting physical material um, that we're going to pretend that those are going to be books. We can add other information for donor and selector. Um, we don't need to mess with payment or receipt status unless one of those things will not be required. So we might say, um, for one reason or another, payment's not required for this particular thing that we're requiring. Um, we can define a variety of other information. The important things are going to be the price. It needs a price. It needs a physical quantity because it's something physical that we're ordering here. And there is a, an accordion for physical resource details because of the format selection we made. So there could be electronic resource details here. There could be both. We'll see that in the next example that we do. We're going to choose a simple material type book. And notice again that the create inventory setting is by default instance holding an item for physical materials. We could make an adjustment to that if for one reason or another we wanted to, but for now we'll leave it as is. And we'll add a location here uh, for the quantity of things that we're ordering. If there's a main still, say that there are going to be four. Uh, so we have a quantity of four. We could say that two are going to one location, two are going to another location. For simplicity's sake, we'll just say all four are going to this one location at the moment. And I'm going to create that per store line. So now, uh, nothing's happened yet to this order. Um, in order to have that interaction happen between inventory, possibly have the order information sent out by EDI when that connection is built, um, and actually make encumbrances, we're going to talk about in a second, based on information that we've added to the purchase order line, we have to open the order. This is one thing that I forgot to do was to add some fund distributions. So we wanna talk about that. So I can actually select, um, maybe we'll just use African history here and we'll say that 100% of this particular order is gonna be paid by that fund. So there is a connection there between the finance app, the funds that we've created there, and the purchase order. And we're actually selecting one of those funds or many of those funds, and we're assigning percentage of the cost to it. Um, so that is how we're going to ultimately generate encumbrances against those funds for this purchase order, but only at the point that we actually open the order. So when we go to do that, because a number of things are gonna happen, the system will confirm with us. We want to do that. Yes, we do. And that's going to open our order. And again, it needs to be an active vendor. Um, we need to actually have 
title information, our purchase order line, material type, all those required fields in order to open the order. And now we can see receive as a possibility. But we're going to put that on pause for a minute here. Uh, we're going to remember our purchase order number. And I believe the plan is to create a second order before we move on. So the second order we're going to create is an ongoing order. Very similar amount of information. We use the same prefix so that these are easier to find uh, if we need to search. Instead of one time, we're going to use ongoing. And that's going to require some additional information from this order. Um, it's going to allow us to populate some renewal information. And I feel like it's worth mentioning that uh, this functionality is actually in discussion again uh, at this point in time. So if you're interested in talking more about renewal information, keep an eye out the, the upcoming resource management meetings, I believe the one this Friday, uh, and potentially a couple of more, depending on how, many, how much of the stuff we get through. Uh, we're actually talking more about renewals functionality with, with respect to ordering. So at the moment, the details that we can define here are an interval. Let's say this is going to renew every 365 days. The initial renewal date here, we should be able to populate. So let's imagine it's going to renew a year from now, August 21st. There will be a review period of 90 days where we're able to make decisions about whether we want it to renew or not. Um, and it could either in theory automatically renew or we could say we want uh, a, an individual to have to intervene we want this to be a manual renewal someone's gonna have to actually come in here and say yes we want to renew this thing at some point in those 90 days and again we don't have to set up workflow status for this particular thing mark demo as our addresses again And we'll say, okay. So we've now got an ongoing order and we want to add a PO line for this particular thing. Again, we're gonna start with a title. Maybe this time we'll use something journal-esque. Um, so we're gonna imagine that we're um, ordering a journal subscription. Journal of Mathematics sounds okay to me. A lot of information there. Okay. What do I want to have to do? So Journal of Mathematics, and again, it's pulled in some of the information there. Uh, relating to journal mathematics, but we have to finish or complete our order form saying this purchase vendor system, it's from the Gobi system. Um, and we'll imagine that this is actually a mix of, of physical and electronic material. So for one reason or another, we're going to get some physical copies, we're going to get some electronic uh, copies associated with it. And uh, the distinction that I'll make here is for things that we're ordering um, where the quantity is going to equal what we are expecting to receive, we'll want to just complete our order form the way that we, we just did for a one-time order, whether it's ongoing or not. Uh, if the quantity that we're ordering, so if we're ordering five things or one thing and we're expecting to receive one thing, um, we could just receive the way we're uh, naturally going to receive. If, if the quantity of things that we're ordering does not equal the quantity of things we're expecting to receive, we'll want to use check-in. I think some people refer to this as serials check-in functionality, but I think um, it's a fair distinction to make that essentially when, we, when we're using this workflow for receiving, it's more about uh, we're ordering a certain quantity, but we're expecting to receive a different quantity of things. Uh, so we've got still a unit price. 
uh, and maybe that price is zero. Sorry, price is zero for our physical things. Um, there's going to be maybe just a quantity one. And we're really only paying for the electronic stuff. Uh, let's say it's 150 per year. Um, and there happens to be some discount information here. So our estimated price is only $135. Again, we can add a fund distribution or two for this. Maybe it's endowments and ABA mathematics. We have mathematics. Doesn't look like it. Let's go with grants. Sure, why not? 50-50. And because this thing is physical, both physical and electronic, uh, there are details for both of those types of material. There is material type here, which is, uh, let's go with electronic resource. This could be text. Um, you can see we, we still got those create inventory options. So for specifically the electronic resources, we don't want to end up having item records. We just want an instance and holding for sure. Um, for physical, we want to end up having those item records and inventory. So we're going to leave that as is. And we're going to add a location once again. I'm just going to keep using main. Uh, and our quantities need to line up. So because we've marked this as a check-in, as, as, as an item for check-in, uh, it's going to be slightly different when, when it comes to receiving. So again, before anything's gonna happen with this, we actually need to open that order. Okay. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, just before we get into receiving, we'll talk briefly about uh, the impact on finances. I have a couple of slides here. So based on those fund distributions we've made, encumbrances are going to be placed against those funds. So in the screenshot we're looking at here, and I'm not sure if everyone will be able to see these amounts, but um, you know, roughly $58 for our one-time gifts, roughly $140 for Latin American history, and so on, is going to be encumbered when we open this order. And so we may have a purchase order that has multiple purchase order lines on it. Each of those purchase order lines has a number of fund distributions, and there will be encumbrances against all of those funds, okay? Uh, so money's encumbered when the order is open. We will then have the opportunity to make adjustments to those encumbrances when we actually get invoices, uh, or not adjustments to the encumbrances, but adjustments to the fund distributions. So there can be a slight difference between uh, what we plan to pay, of course, and what we end up paying in reality. But when we're creating the invoice lines, uh, if they relate to a specific order, you'll, that information is sort of pulled in and you can make adjustments to the fund distributions if adjustments need to be made at time of payment, essentially. When you uh, approve an invoice, those encumbrances will be uh, well, those encumbrance, the, the, the amount of money encumbered will drop based on how much you are paying um, at that point in time. And at some point, those encumbrances will be released, even if they aren't. So if you plan to spend more than you actually spent, uh, you'll be able to release those encumbrances very easily at point of invoice. Uh, and if you are not spending, or if you're spending more than 
uh, what you plan to spend. Um, you wouldn't actually need to release those encumbrances, but they'll effectively be released by you over, you know, spending more than you than you plan to. So the system will help you uh, keep track of encumbrances. And by default for a one-time order, you're going to release the encumbrances after a single invoice. For ongoing orders, uh, the user would have to say, I'm now ready to release all encumbrances for that purchase order line. So there's a connection between the invoice line and the purchase order line, and that's what allows you to control whether you release encumbrances or not. Um, and the system will keep track of how much is encumbered, how much has been paid, and so on uh, in the background for you. And you'll see all that information on your fund. I know I'm kind of glancing over that. I would love to go into more detail here, but um, I also want to stick to the real software for this demo. So if there are any questions, I'm going to keep going into receiving and check in. We don't have any questions at the moment. Lovely. All right, so we'll look at now receiving our one-time order for a few copies of um, the book that we've actually ordered here. Uh, search PM number. Oh, they're right here at the top. So in order to receive this particular book, all we need to do is find that purchase order or the purchase order line. So remember, you could be looking at purchase order lines. You could have maybe searched for that title. Uh, you'll see the receive button there as well. And the same result. We're going to click receive, receive here. And it's going to show us, because there could potentially be many purchase order lines on this purchase order, it, it would show us all the titles that we've ordered on this particular order and how many items we're expecting to receive. So for here, um, and this is that sort of traditional, we've ordered a quantity of items, we're going to receive that quantity and then be done with. Uh, so we've got zero for receive. I'm going to select that, click receive. And we'll notice that there's actually already a bit of connection here between uh, this area and the inventory app. Um, we can actually define barcode information here for these items. And as I'm doing that, it's selecting these things for receiving. Um, I can make some comments here. I can change the location uh, that these should be ending up in. And I can possibly change the item status as well that I'd like them to. Uh, so I can, I can change the resulting item status at this point in time as well. But I'm going to leave things as is. So we're going to receive three of these particular copies. Maybe one is lagging behind for some reason. Um, and once we've done that, we'll end up in the receiving history. And it'll show us that uh, we've received three of these things. We go back, we'll see that we received three of four. We're still expecting one. If we've done something here by mistake, we can actually select one of these and remove it from this area. That's just going to bring it back to expected. So right now it's actually uh, received. And if I head back to the order itself, and we click on the title, It'll take us to inventory. It'll show us the items that we have on order here. So because we had defined that connection, instance holding item, when we actually open that order, it created items for us. Um, and as part of that receiving process, we've added barcode information and we've updated the item status in inventory of these particular items. You can see that one of them is still on order and the other three have been received. If I can go back to this receiving area, just quickly show you history. If we remove one of these guys, it's going to tell us that it's going to change that item status back to on order. So we're now two of four instead of three of four. Uh, if we were to look in inventory, we'd see it was on order. When we go to receive those things again, um, we can update the barcode information. If I 
for both of these things. Click next. Now received everything that we expected to receive. And all of that information will have been updated in inventory. And we can also see that the workflow status is now closed. Reason for closure is complete. So there is that communication as part of receiving in this sort of traditional flow where we're ordering a quantity and we're receiving that quantity that system is going to complete that order for you once you've finished receiving all those items. Okay. The second scenario we have here Okay. Is the check in. So for this particular order, because we've indicated that we want to check these items in, we actually do that from the purchase order line. So we'll click on the purchase order line and we have access to, because the order is open, have access to check in. And here, we don't actually see any pieces yet. We have the ability to add pieces that we're expecting to arrive. We can add a piece with a caption maybe, uh, let's say issue one. Location is going to be main. Uh, and this, the format of this thing, these are the physical things, because this was both uh, electronic and physical that we're ordering. So we're actually going to create, we're only going to create pieces for the physical items that we're receiving. So we're going to see physical here and we can actually add that item record now to relate to this thing. And it's actually going to bring up the actual inventory form here um, where we need to populate a few bits of detail. Load. So we've now created that item in inventory uh, and we could actually check in this piece right now or we could save and just say this is an expected piece. So again, when we go back and we actually look at this item in inventory, our journals, uh, there's one, we defined a barcode for it already. That may not in fact be the case oftentimes, but um, the status is still on order because we have not yet received that thing. We have not yet checked it in. It's maybe a better way to say that. So outside of that, um, once the pieces have been created, it's very similar to that receiving workflow. We're going to select the ones that we, whatever issue we have in our hand, we're going to click check in. It's going to bring up that item information from inventory because it uh, has a connection to that item. And again, we could change the resulting status. Maybe we want this to be immediately available or something like that. Um, we could update the barcode information at this point necessary, and we can indicate that that thing has been checked in. So now in the history, we'll see all of the issues that we've actually checked in against that purchase order line. And we'll see what's been expected depending on how many pieces that we've added. Are there any specific questions on check-in? I just want to make sure that everyone's still with me here. So we're coming up on 1030. Nothing's come in yet. Okay. So we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, placing holds. And um, I'm not sure if I am the best person to be uh, covering over this functionality, but at the moment, in order to place a hold on something that is on order, it would need to have a barcode or have barcode information. 
Um, so as you can see in the situation we're in right now, we just checked in something, potentially. Um, if we had imagined we hadn't quite checked that in yet, so we defined the barcode when we added the piece, but maybe we're going to apply that barcode to the thing when it actually arrives, um, logically. Because it does have one, if we look at inventory quickly, go back to our item, even though the status is on order, if I grab this barcode information, I can place a request on this particular item. So let's say it's a hold. Um, a requester here. Mm -hmm. I have a barcode for my user. Oh, so many more Dennis's than I expected. Okay. <laughs> So, so long as that information is present, we should be able to place our request. And again, this is the current build 3.1. Um, so something needs to have, the item needs to have a barcode uh, and you need to be able to find that user information, but you should be able to place requests on items that are on hold. Um, and now we would update the item status either manually in inventory uh, or as part of that, again, as part of our check-in workflow. So I might come back to that item, check it in. Uh, it's going to make a communication inventory, which will then be reflected in the request. Okay. So the other thing that we would want to do possibly to complete this order, because the system doesn't understand uh, or isn't expecting a set number of items, at the moment in this 3.1 build, it's up to the user to decide that this order is in fact completed. Um, and for an ongoing order, it may not necessarily mean that it's completed. It may be uh, that this has been ceased or that we're canceling it, uh, a variety of different reasons. And so when you decide to close that order, you select your reason for closure. Remember that we can define whatever reason for closure that we want. And write a note on that closure. And that's going to update this workflow status to close, capture the reason for closure, and the notes that we've associated with it. Now to the really exciting part. I think <laughs> we're going to take a look at some of what is upcoming for uh, the 3.2 release, the DAISY release. So I'm going to switch over to the testing environment. And I think immediately you're going to see that there's, a, there's already a big change in the look and feel of Folio. And that's not just our acquisitions modules, but uh, a lot of the usability work that's being done uh, is, is, you know, going to show through here when we look at the contrast between this 3.1 release um, and the current build of Folio.
can see it actually looks very different. And I know that there were there was a lot of input um, regarding you know colors and and contrast. And so I think you can immediately see the difference there if you haven't taken a look at this recently. And what we're going to look at just briefly, I want to show some of the changes that are happening in the organizations app. So we'll go right back to the beginning of our exploration here. Uh, and we'll look at... Dennis, you might blow it up just a bit. Yes, thank you. Also, just want to thank everybody for sticking around if you, because I think we're now sort of four minutes over, but I'm, we're going to keep going just to get through this, the last number of things here. Um, should be about 15 more minutes if I can speed through it. So some of the usability updates that are made or that have been made to the organizations app um, relate to buttons that are being used for remove. Uh, so if I'm adding address information here, rather than the remove buttons, we actually have little trash cans, which is kind of how things have been done in other areas of the system. And really differentiates between, uh, you know, delete and removal of aspects of the record. So much easier to see that you're actually deleting something. Uh, we moved a lot of the functionality into these carrot menus and um, followed some of the other patterns that were already existing. Also, um, something that's relatively new. If you have an organization that is actually a vendor and you decide that they are no longer going to be a vendor or you are just editing your vendor record and you make the mistake of unchecking that box and you didn't want to, there's now a warning that, that lets you know that if you remove this, obviously those vendor, uh, that vendor information, the accordions associated with it are going to be removed and that information will be cleared. So it's going to ask you to confirm that that's something you actually want to do here um, or not. And if not, then it's just going to recheck the vendor toggle for you uh, and you can keep going. So we've incorporated some of those uh, little usability enhancements, quality of life improvements into the organization's app. You'll see that in the upcoming version. That's a lightning fast look at it. The other really important thing uh, that's coming or one of the other really exciting features that exists in that three point run release, but I didn't want to talk about it in that context because it's not quite finished yet, is purchase order templates. So finally, we'll fully be able to use uh, to their full power purchase order templates in this upcoming release. Um, and in order to do that, we would navigate to order settings, order templates, and create some order templates for ourselves. The only thing that's required in a template is the name. So uh, that's one thing that we need for a template. You can also use code and add a description and do all these things. And beyond that, you can actually incorporate any and all information regarding a purchase order and its purchase order lines. So here um, we can define prefixes as part of the templates, uh, ship to addresses, build to addresses, the order types, notes, uh, approval, you know, even title information. If for one reason or another, you might be ordering, you know, a, a number of different copies or something for different locations, something like that. Uh, you can pre-populate item details as part of that. Um, acquisition methods, the order format. So we can actually specify in this template, this is a template for physical resources maybe for a specific vendor even, uh, you know, physical resources from Amazon. Uh, we can add, maybe in general, we want to have a quantity of one, different vendor information, fund distributions, uh, and even specific order details, material types so on and so forth. Um, but none of that is really necessary uh, unless it's coupled with, you know, a product ID needs a type. So, and like we just saw a vendor reference number needs a vendor reference number type kind of thing. 
Um, other than that, creating templates, there are no required fields. <clears throat> so we can go in after the fact to the orders application and leverage these templates to create orders uh, much quicker, uh, to create orders in succession, create multiple purchase order lines. And all we have to do is just select the template. So you can filter through all of your templates that you've created. Uh, choose one, it's gonna populate all the information here. And it'll actually carry through to the purchase order lines as well. So when we add a purchase order line to this purchase order, you can see that our test template is already selected. Uh, all we really have to do here is add the title information because we've already got our acquisition method and other order details already populated. We just add a price and a title uh, and a location in this case because I didn't pre-populate location, but uh, you get the idea. So these purchase order templates will allow you to, you know, define certain criteria for uh, ordering and reuse. Uh, all of that effort uh, to create orders much quicker. Next thing that is a big thing <laughs> that's going to be released here in 3.2 is the actual invoice app. So in the current 3.1 build, we actually didn't deploy the invoice app because it wasn't quite ready for release. Um, but now in this upcoming release, you'll be able to create invoices and invoice lines. Um, unfortunately, we can't save data in these environments, in the testing environment, so bear with me. Um, so important thing about a, an invoice is it, it has a vendor invoice number. Obviously, that's the invoice number that, you know, came from the vendor, was generated by the vendor. It'll also have a Folio invoice number that's internal to Folio that identifies uh, this particular invoice uniquely in the Folio system. We can attach documents, we can do other things to invoices in general. Um, the important thing about an invoice, if it's not coming in, being imported in, you know, electronically, when you're building it, you actually have the ability to leverage purchase order lines that have already been created uh, or to just create invoice lines uh, freehand, so to speak. So here we're going to base this. We're going to assume that this is an invoice for a purchase order that we've already created. So we're going to select that purchase order line uh, and it's going to pull in cost details and quantity and all those things. Um, if we needed to edit the fund distributions, for example, or uh, to edit, you know, adjustments that are being applied to this invoice line and the invoice as a whole, we can do that here. Add adjustments like GST, which might be 5%, depending on where you are in the world, in addition to the total. Uh, so adjustments can relate to the subtotal in different ways. Uh, in addition to would obviously mean 5% of 900 is going to be applied in addition to the total versus should be considered included in uh, or entirely separate from because it's going to be paid elsewhere, which is a very unique scenario. But um, we're, our adjustments are flexible enough to accommodate that. Um, so when we see those adjustments here, the total, uh, and this will all roll up to the invoice as a whole. Um, these invoices will also display on orders. So as you're creating and approving invoices, um, when we look at the orders app, there are actually related invoice information now displaying on orders as well. So as you're paying invoices, that information is going to be captured on the order itself. And there's a quick reference link from one to the other. So we can always find those uh, quickly and easily. And the last bit of info that I wanted to, the last big thing that I wanted to touch on 
is, is the ability to create and assign acquisition units. Uh, so this is done in settings as well. There is an area in settings called acquisition units where we can actually create acquisition units and assign users to those units. Uh, so here we have demo unit. Um, and there, the way that this will work is these units are applied to different records. So you can apply this unit to an invoice or an order or a fund, for example, and it will restrict the ability of users who are not on this or not a part of this unit, it will restrict their ability to use their permissions. So if I am a user that can create, edit and delete orders, if I'm not on this demo unit team and it is assigned to an order, um, it's possible for that team to prevent me from editing, creating, deleting, or viewing even uh, that order, even though I have the general permissions for orders already. So it's another level of restriction that allows you to sort of group users together and say that this group of users can work with these things and that group of users can work with those things. Um, and this is a tough one to go through really quickly, but I'll show you that, that creating them is fairly simple. Um, we define obviously the name of the unit. We define the restrictions that it will put. Uh, so this particular unit, only members of this unit will be able to edit, create, or delete the things, the records that this unit is assigned to. So if I create that, save that, um, I will now want to assign some users, namely probably the user I'm logged in as right now, which I think is not going to be that, it's going to be DQ. Right now I'm logged in as administrator, so I want to make sure that administrator is a part of this team. Uh, so now when I create an order, I'll be able to assign this team to that, to that order, for example. Go back to orders here and just we'll try creating new. This is my test template. And I'll assign the acquisition unit demo unit here. So now uh, we can see that that order is assigned to the demo unit. And again, this is the testing environment. So um, it's a little bit glitchy here still. Uh, this is functionality that's coming and uh, it will actually allow you to restrict uh, at a more granular level who's able to work with what orders or who is able to work with what funds down the road. So we're very excited about this uh, acquisition unit functionality coming together. Um, and for the time being in testing, you can actually create these units, you can assign users to them, and you can assign these units to records like orders and invoices. Uh, and we're going to obviously build on that functionality. So that brings me to the end of uh, the handful of stuff that I wanted to show today, wanted to walk through with everybody. Thank you so much for paying attention and, and uh, sticking around through the technical difficulties that we had, those of you who were able to stay. If there are any questions, I wanted to leave some time to, to address some of that as well. So we'll open it up for questions. And I can appreciate that we're a little over time here, so folks might be ready to get back to their <laughs> Uh, daily activities, but uh, I won't take offense. Looks like you're so thorough that you got it all covered. <laughs> I hope it was that clear and that simple, yeah. <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks very much for having me. Thank you very much, Dennis. It was great. UMass says that there are five colleges that they're they're hungry. So <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. So thank you, everyone. Uh, like Dennis said, I appreciate you, your patience and um, staying with us while we work through the technical difficulties. Um, there will be a this will be posted to the YouTube channel at some point. It may there may be a little delay on that. Uh, I think the person who usually does that is out of the office right now. And it may also take some time to edit the two pieces together. So, but keep an eye out for that. And with that, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Thank, thank you, Eric. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>